work as, uh, as the cliche goes, a rocket scientist, but given that most people generally don't believe you when you say you're a rocket scientist, um, I normally tell people I just set Buckinghamshire on fire for a living, um, which is pretty much what I do. Um, I'm involved with building this space plane in Oxfordshire at the moment, uh, and I'll come on to that and why that's such a disruptive technology. Um, as if building rockets wasn't enough for my main line of work, um, my hobby is also rockets. Um, so if we need anyone to launch reliant rockets for top here, or um, escapologists over the Danube in, in Hungary, then come and give me a, a, a call. Um, right, what I'm going to be looking at is where are we going in the next five years of space uh, in terms of manned space flight? Uh, what's happening in the next 10 years, what is being done to make it happen, and when, where we're going next after that. Um, I've tried to keep it to the fairly near term because it's uh, more applicable uh, to the Humanity Plus conference, I thought. Uh, although I will come up with a fairly wacky news of the slides at the end if, if I get that far. Um, right, <laughs> anyone who wants to go to space would agree they want that. That's why they want to go, um, or if you're British, you want that, um, which to my mind is a little bit more stylish, but there you go. Um, in terms of what's happening now, things are very, very exciting. It's, it's, within the last five or ten years, uh, the technologies have advanced to such a level that we're now seeing a fair bit of development within uh, the suborbital space, suborbital, i.e., anything that doesn't go round the Earth in an orbit, uh, but just goes straight up and straight down. Um, probably the, the most noteworthy of these is Virgin Galactic with Spaceship Two, uh, which is the plane you see in the top two photos. Uh, that's now being flight tested, that's being dropped from about 30,000 to 40,000 feet. Um, and they're hoping to be flying it with the rocket engine by the end of this year and carrying passengers. Optimistically, they reckon by the end of this year, but, but realistically, I think it's going to be a year or two yet. Uh, the other small photos you see are some of the other contenders who are developing rockets that are des designed for carrying people. Uh, this is Maston Space Systems on, on the left. Uh, that's x in the middle, and on the other side is Armadillo Aerospace and Blue Origin. Now, Blue Origin is quite interesting uh, because it's funded by the chap who founded uh, Amazon.com, Jeff Bezos. So there's an awful lot of money behind it. Uh, we don't know much about what they're doing, though, because they're very secretive about their spacecraft, but we know it's flow. Um, the, the important thing to notice here is this is not NASA. Here are commercial organisations and they are going out there, they are building and flying rockets. So the chance of any of you to get into space in your lifetime has gone up immeasurably in the last five to ten years. You can see from the rocket results, these are not made up, these are actual photos apart from the space plane uh, in the centre. Everything else is happening now. Orbital space is starting to get interesting as well. There's a company called SpaceX developing the Falcon 9, which is a uh, large orbital rocket. Uh, they've flown it successfully twice so far, um, and that's quite a, a record in itself, because generally you find new rockets tend to fail. Um, it's designed to carry a capsule, uh, the Dragon capsule, uh, which you can see in the upper photos, um, that's designed to carry seven people to the International Space Station or potentially to space hotels, uh, which I'll come on to. And again, that's not such a laughing matter anymore. Uh, the capsule on the right hand side, as you can see there, is scorched. Uh, that's the first time that a commercial organisation has ever brought back a space capsule through the atmosphere uh, intact. So that's a very, very good sign for orbital space. It, it seems to indicate that we're, we're well on the way with orbital spaceflight. Uh, a 
and you will see that flying again this year. Um, there's a few other contenders. Um, there's a company called Sierra Nevada developing the Dream Chaser, which is this big uh, photo gear for space plane. Uh, that's based on NASA technologies from the 1980s and 1990s. So a lot of their work is already developed. And they're hoping to be flying that with passengers to orbit in the next four or five years. Again, possibly a bit optimistic, but um, I wish them luck. And on the right-hand side, the upper right, that's Boeing. Boeing have jumped into the game, and they're planning on developing a manned capsule as well. Um, again, a similar time frame, 2015, 2016, but we'll, we'll see. But certainly within the next 10 years. Now the problem with all the orbital vehicles is they throw away the technology. On the way, on the way to get up there, you throw away the first stage, the second stage, leaving a small bit at the top. Um, frankly, I think that's rubbish. And we believe we have the answer in a small corner of Oxfordshire. So I'm going to play an animation uh, in a second to show you where um, we're going to go with that. Um, now, all these places, or, or, all these uh, rockets, they need a destination. Uh, the most likely place they're going to be going is the International Space Station initially, but there's also a company called Bigelow Aerospace, which is developing inflatable space stations. And as you can see from um, the ones they've got in their large industrial plant in uh, Nevada, uh, these are not small. Uh, we're talking about structures in space that are going to be a lot more habitable than the existing space station, which is a bit small and can-like. Um, the photo in the centre uh, shows that they've actually orbited one of these. In, in fact, they've orbited two. Uh, these, are, these are just test um, vehicles at the moment. They're about two to three metres diameter, uh, so you couldn't really shove a person in there easily. Uh, but they're looking at launching the full size ones you see at the top there uh, within the next three to four years. Uh, so things are looking very exciting there in terms of us actually having real space hotels within this decade. Um, now, coming back to where, we go, or where we're going to go next in terms of getting up there, I have a short animation. Um, basically, we're working on a space plane called Skyline, uh, developed in uh, Cullen in Oxfordshire. It's based on the HOTOL study that was done back in the 1980s, uh, which was a British space plane concept. Um, there were a few technical problems with HOTOL, uh, which meant that uh, when the, the study was disbanded in 1988, um, it evolved into Skyline. Um, and what we've done is we've moved the wings forward, we've moved one of the fins at the front and the back, um, and the next idea is to move the engines out onto the nacelles on, on the edge of the wings. By doing that, uh, you instantly improve the balance of the vehicle so it becomes a lot more stable during flight so you don't have to carry anything to ballast it or, um, or such like. Uh, the red uh, things you just saw there are the hydrogen tanks. It runs on hydrogen and oxygen uh, but it uses air breathing rocket engines and that's the key to why we think we can make this go up all the way into orbit in a single stage and return without throwing any bits away. Uh, now this is quite novel. The Americans have been trying to do this for years and they've got nowhere. Uh, but I would contend that's probably because they take the wrong approach. And they, they've sort of put every rocket engine um, and, as well as kitchen sinks on theirs and that's why their, their spacecraft tend to be over heavy so that they, they can't do it in one stage. Um, where this is clever is that you have, rock, you have rocket engines at the back, um, you have effectively a compressor, like in a jet engine in the middle, and a big cooling system on the front. Um, and that allows the thing to operate like a jet uh, during flight, up, up to Mach 5. Um, the bit I work on is, is the pipe and the engines at the back. 
anything at the front, please don't ask me questions on it. It's all stuff and I don't understand how that works. Um, but basically, it's, it looks fairly complicated, but it's actually a fairly simple uh, engine, and, and I can draw it out if anyone wants to understand more. Basically, air comes into it, hot air is sent around the outside of the nacelle and is burned uh, in ram jets, and cool air is drawn into the middle through a cooling system, and that's fed into the rocket engines. And we believe that this is a much, much better way to do it uh, than any, any other system out there at the moment. Right, that's the, I'll, I'll leave the rest of that because it gets a bit boring and uh, technical. Now, this is where the, the advantage of the single stage vehicle comes in. We're talking about carrying a decent number of passengers, not you know, the seven people you get going up on the capsules, but we're talking of eventually taking between 20 and 30 people up there. And in some style, I don't know about you, but I certainly, if I want to go to space, I don't want to be crammed in in a small sardine pan. I want to go in a civilised manner. Okay, not with a drinks cabinet, or that would be nice, but certainly <laughs> something that has a little bit more style to it. Um, um, as you can see, there's plenty of room on this, uh, plenty of room for a large number of passengers, and um, in fact, one of these seats here is reserved for Aubrey de Grey. Uh, in, in, that's on condition he can help me live for another 50 years to uh, <laughs> move on to the next generation of this. But yeah, I have spoken with my bosses and they said yes. <laughs> is this really happening? Yes, it absolutely is. Uh, the wind tunnel tests have been done. Um, we've been testing the rocket engine in Buckinghamshire, and that's probably why my hearing isn't that good. Um, you're supposed to stay in a control room when you fire these rocket engines, but I said for safety reasons, I had to go and check how loud they were. And the answer is fair. Um, basically, the low photo you see there, with the thing with the large red ring, that's a jet engine. Uh, with a cooling system on the front that approximates the actual um, space plug uh, engine. So again, it's something that we're testing on a fairly large scale, so we can be confident that it will work when we combine all the technologies on the space plane. Uh, so once you've got this space plane, you then end up with a very, very disruptive technology that effectively puts every other launch vehicle out of business overnight. Um, so I'm expecting people to probably come around at night and shoot me somewhere in the next five or ten years um, and the rest of the team. Um, this is the type of thing we'll be able to do with it. You're no longer talking about small structures in space, but when you have a space plane that can fly up every day uh, as a scheduled service, you can start building things like space docks, orbital base stations. Now the advantage of having something like this is you could build a vehicle within that structure uh, because it would be solid panels around it. And that means if you drop a spanner or something, you can float off and go and retrieve it. Um, because the last thing you want is a spanner floating off at 18,000 miles an hour and whacking a space shuttle because it's uh, going to give them a fairly bad day if that happens. Um, so we're looking at that building base stations of this size. This is, this is massive compared with the existing space station. Um, but it op opens up an awful lot of opportunities because if you fill that space, uh, so you don't have doors that open on it, uh, you can use that internally for people to do what they like. Space sports, uh, you name it. 